In the last video, we put together this 16 note chromatic arpeggiator, which, to be fair, does sound rather annoying. But now that we're operating in a digital space, it's actually comparably easy to make things more musical. And to make things more musical, we need to think about scales. A scale, if you look at it from a technical perspective, is like a set of rules. It tells you exactly which notes are and are not allowed. Uh, take C major, for example, because it's really simple. Only natural notes are allowed. All the sharp or flat notes are forbidden. So we get this pattern for C major. And since we have already mapped our bit states to musical notes, let's uh, group those accordingly. If we look at all the 16 states in our 4-bit space, we end up with these 9 allowed and 7 forbidden ones. Now the question is, how do we make sure that our arpeggiator only plays the allowed notes, not the forbidden ones? This is where working with bits comes in handy again, because it allows us to work with combinational logic. You can think of that as a set of very basic instructions that you can string together to form more complex rules. Here's the four instructions we're going to use. First, there's not. It's pretty straightforward. The output is always the opposite of the input. And down here it is an action. I'm using a 4106, which is six inverters in one chip. If I change the input, which is represented by this red LED, the output flips accordingly. Next, there's AND. This is a bit more tricky since it has two inputs instead of just one. But apart from that, it's pretty self-explanatory. The output is only one if input one and input two are one. This down here is the 4081, a quad end gate. Right now, only input two is on, so the output is off. But if I turn on input one as well, the output comes on. OR is similar in that it also has two inputs, but here the output is on if input 1 or input 2 or both are on. Since I don't have OR gates on a chip, I'm improvising with two diodes, which are effectively doing the same thing. Uh, since both inputs are off right now, the output is also off. But if I turn on either of the inputs, or both, the output comes on. Lastly, we have XOR, which is shorthand for exclusive OR. It's similar to a regular OR, but the output is only on if input 1 or input 2 are on, not both. For this, I'm using a 4070 quad XOR chip. Right now, both the inputs are off, so the output is also off. If I turn on one input bit, the output comes on. But if I turn on both input bits, the output turns off again. So to detect the allowed and forbidden states, we could just define a logic rule for every one of them. Say we name our bits, b1, b2, b3, and b4. Then to check if we're dealing with this state in particular, we could define this rule. This is how it works. The part within the braces is only going to be zero if all the bits are zero. Then, if we invert the result, we get a 1 if it matches with this state. Now, doing that for all our 16 states is not really the most economic solution. We can already save ourselves a lot of work if we realize that we only have to check for the allowed or the forbidden states. Not both, because if we know which states are allowed, we also implicitly know which ones are not, and vice versa. Since there are less forbidden than allowed states, let's focus on the forbidden ones. Coming up with 7 rules instead of 16 sounds doable, right? Well, we can actually cut it down even more. If we group our bit states by looking only at b1, we can divide them up like this. And with this group of forbidden states, we can actually work out a clear pattern. While b1 is always 1, b3 and b4 are always the same value. Compare this to our allowed states. Here, if b1 is 1, b3 and b4 always differ. So it's safe to say that this is a sufficient rule to identify these four forbidden bit states. 
Now, how do we represent this with our logic operators? First, let's think about B3 and B4. These need to be equal. And if you look at the XOR's input-output table, you can see that it basically checks for that. If the inputs are equal, it puts out a 0. And if they differ, you get a 1. So all we need to do is check for B3, XOR, B4. And then we need to invert the result. So that's the first part of our rule. The other part is quite simple. If this part's output is 1, that means B3 and B4 are equal, B1 also needs to be 1. So we can just use the AND operator. Uh, that leaves us with this complete rule. The other group is a little more complicated. At first glance, it seems like we can apply the same tactic, just invert it. Because while B1 is always 0 here, B3 and B4 always differ. Uh, that would leave us with this rule. Not B1 and B3 XOR B4. Note how the NOT operator's position has changed. But if we look at the allowed states, uh, this one falls under the same criteria. So we have to be a bit more specific. What separates our forbidden states from this particular allowed state is that with the forbidden ones, B2 or B4 is on, while the allowed one has both at zero. We can check for this by doing B2 or B4. And then we need to add this to the rest of our rule by using AND. Now to bring these two groups and their rules together, we can simply chain them with an OR. Uh, that leaves us with this monstrosity. I'm sure there's some clever ways to slim this down even more, but this is as far as I got. To make this rather unwieldy formula a bit more manageable, we can transfer it into a graphical format like this. Let's see how it matches up with our instructions. We start out with the inverse of B1 and feed that into an AND gate. That's this first part. Then we're using this XOR gate on B3 and B4 and we feed the output into another AND gate. Uh, that's this part right here. Finally, we feed B2 and B4 into this OR gate, connecting the output to the same AND gate. So we get this part. And the result of that gets fed into another AND gate together with our inverted B1. And that's the first rule completed. For the second one, we're starting at B1 again. We can trace this line to an AND gate. That's uh, this part. For B3, X or B4, we can reuse this gate here. The output is then inverted and also fed into the AND gate. And that's the entire second rule. Then to combine the two rules, we just feed them into this OR gate. And if we look at the output, we expect to only see it turn on if the input bits match with a node that is not allowed in C major. To see if it actually works, I've built this circuit. Here's our four inputs. And over here is our output. Right now the inputs are all turned off, which corresponds to a C. And since the C is allowed in C major, the output is also off. But if I turn on bits 2 and 3, which corresponds to an F sharp, the output comes on. Because no sharp notes are allowed in C major. If I now turn off bit 2, the output goes off as well, because uh, 0, 1, 0, 0 corresponds to an E, which is allowed. So it seems like our circuit is working. We have one more thing to figure out though. So far we only know if a bit state is allowed or forbidden. But how do we prevent our MDAC from converting one of the forbidden states into a voltage? Well, to solve this problem we can use logic gates again. 
the first idea I came up with is just turning all the bits off if they correspond to a forbidden node. That way they just get converted into a C, which is allowed. And to do this, we can just invert the result of our scale check so that it now only turns on if the input node is allowed. Then we can use these four end gates to compare our input bits to the circuit's output. If a node is allowed, the end gates will basically just pass our input bits through. But if it's forbidden, they will shut everything off. Connect the AND gates outputs to our MDAC and we should have our C major arpeggio. So I'll add this to our circuit. So on this board here I have set up the 4040 binary counter, which acts as our data source. Then on this board is our scale check plus the added scale correction. You can think of the whole thing like a data processor. And this sends its output onto this improvised 4-bit bus. From here I've connected this little monitoring circuit, plus of course the MDAC. And I'm sending a very slow LFO as a clock to the counter chip. These LEDs now show us the input data. And up here is the processor's output, which is mirroring the data on the bus. Now every time our scale check detects a node that is not allowed in C major, this LED comes on and all the data lines on the bus go low. Let's hear what it sounds like. Since there's a lot of low Cs in this arpeggio, I started thinking about a more elegant way to exchange the forbidden notes with the loud ones. Uh, so I came up with this concept. If you compare all the circuit bit states, you'll notice a useful pattern. Every sharp note seems to be identical with its paired natural one, uh, except for the first bit. So it's safe to say that inverting the first bit of a forbidden state would turn it into an allowed one. Implementing this idea is really simple. We can feed our bits B2, B3 and B4 straight into the MDAC. To deal with bit 1, we can send it into an XOR gate, together with the non-inverted output of our scale checking circuit. Uh, here's how it works. If our scale checker is off, meaning the node is allowed, the XOR gate is passing through our bit 1 unchanged. But if our scale checker flips on, the XOR's output will be the opposite of bit 1. Send this into our MDAC and we have an ascending C major scale arpeggio. So as you can see, our scale processor is no longer just shutting everything off if it detects a node that it doesn't like. Instead, it transforms them into allowed ones by flipping the first bit. Let's hear what it sounds like. In the next video, we'll try and make this even more useful in a musical sense by coming up with different ways to generate input data for our processor.